Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. To brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus tells a parable, and it is so straightforward that I'm kind of surprised he didn't begin it with the -the over-the-top joke and saying that the tenants were actually named the Blairises. How do you not see who this is against? How do you not feel the frustration over Israel's treatment of the prophets in his voice, in his tone, in his tenor? That is their refusal to share the gifts given, their quest for idols that has taken shape of golden calf and love of power alike. They kill the prophets that were sent to them because they see their position as under attack. They have come to believe that this thing belongs to them. An irony of irony is that it was supposed to. The prophets were not sent to take away the vineyard, but have it return to faithfulness. Or if you're following along in the parable, to collect a portion of the harvest and bring it home. This is so straightforward that everyone gets it, but then again, maybe not because, well, they heard it and they actually thought, you know what? Let's arrest him and kill him just like the parable said that we would, and that will show him that he's wrong. Sin makes you stupid. It defies logic. That's why they call it sin. Sin breaks stuff. It is a long list of things that will set aside all of reality. Every way that we would normally receive God's good creation turns it upside down, turns it in on itself, shatters it on the floor, and leaves us pointing at each other over who did what. And from the outside looking in, it turns the tragedy that is Christ plodding his way to Jerusalem through Lent to die for the sins of the world almost, almost into a comedy. You watch the chief priests called by God to hand out mercy to sinners, try to find a leg to stand on, not on their call from God to be there in the first place, but as the qualification of being those who don't need mercy in the first place. And you wonder why this thing was set up to crash. If the whole thing revolves around mercy and the people standing up front insist that they don't need any of it, Don't you think that might change how they see the ones they were sent to serve? And it's the same story that's been told. The prophets sent to Israel die because nobody wants to be called a sinner. The chief priests, they don't just want to be tenants. They want the vineyard to be theirs. And it is not a stuck in the Old Testament story. These are not stuck in the Old Testament kinds of sins. I deeply understand the chief priests and the Pharisees' conviction. Nobody wants to be owned, controlled, corrected. But really, it's just a confession of unbelief that plays itself out in their actions. If you actually think killing the one sent to collect a part of the harvest will work, it's only because you don't think there's a sender. If you actually think killing these guys will make all the problems go away, it means you don't think there's anything on the other end of this. There's really only this stuff, this vineyard, this world, but not a God in control of it. This church, but not a God who actually shows up to it like you have to. An institution, but not a cause behind it. Just a whole lot of people who are deeply invested in it. And don't you see how that would change the church? It makes her ugly. It makes the people inside of it cower after scraps of what was remembered through rose-colored glasses. Instead of bold to stand, confessing hope to a world around us because hope was promised. It changes the question of the saints who gather inside from how long, O Lord, which was actually given to us to say, into How can I take this for myself? You see, gifts from God cease to be gifts when we think in terms of the inheritance will be ours. Those are the things we grab hold of, stack up in storehouses on earth and name as treasures here. 
that wrath, moth, and rust will destroy. And it's so straightforward that we can connect the dots. How can you not see it? Except maybe not, because we will hear this parable too, and we will think, you know what, let's, let's start over. New Testament church time. We will learn from the mistakes of the priests of old, and we will be a better church than the scribes and the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Blarisees. But it's still on us. Us in charge of having something to hand over when the master returns. Us in charge of keeping this thing going for one more generation. Our harvest, our works. As if our faithfulness is somehow purer than theirs. Our understanding greater because we have iPhones and Google. And so Siri will help me be what you have failed to be, Old Testament church. And sin makes you stupid. <laughs> Even though we are every bit as scared and sinful as the church of old, we are convinced that we will somehow be better. Even though we measure the depth of our own sin in the words that we hide behind when we say, I, a poor, miserable sinner, because you know exactly what you mean when you say them. And even if you won't think about it and just rely on the liturgy to drag the confession out of your mouth, You confront why we cannot just be a better version of the church in every loss, in every funeral, in every story of what used to be eroded by the wages of sin named the last great enemy, death. Because we're starting with ourselves. It will not succeed. Even if we have the very best of intention, the road only gets paved to one place. So instead... This Lent, repent and start with Jesus instead of yourself. The son of the master was sent to collect something. And that story sounds vaguely familiar to anybody who didn't want to get yelled at by a Sunday school teacher so they learned the one word that would answer all of the questions. The son of God saves us from our sins. The answer is Jesus. And so when the Son of God was sent to collect something in this parable, that might just show you your place in it. That might just find out where I can fit inside of this thing without having to brace the whole thing upon my shoulders and then just hope I don't stumble on the same weight that has crushed everybody else. The Son was sent to collect sinners. And so really, if the vineyard is the church... You don't have to be the workers. You get to be what it produces. You get to be the fruit. You get to be the harvest. And the whole thing becomes passive. The whole thing becomes a gift. This is God's vineyard, and he wants to collect the fruit collected out of it. God set up something in order to create faith and raise you up inside of it to be given over unto the Father for life everlasting. This is the gospel narrative. This is where I can find the Son of God, not simply showing up to correct people that aren't me while I watch, because that's fun, but to save me from ever trying to build a stairway to heaven myself, to save me from ever trying to grab hold of the vineyard from the last tenants that failed to do what they were supposed to receive and rejoice because God will care for his vineyard. Sometimes he will use you to do it. But in all of it, the prophets were sent to collect you, a portion of the faithful brought home to life everlasting. The saints gone on to glory that would rip every funeral from the loss category and make it a gain because here the vineyard does not shrink. Here the church cannot die. Here the choir only grows. As over and over again, God sends those to collect the harvest and bring them home. Lent is not a season to think about how to do church more intentionally, but to focus upon the place that got it done, to focus upon the passion of our Lord. Jesus was crucified for sinners, for Pharisees and Blairsies, for the ones who don't understand, for the ones who didn't want it, and even for me, and even for you. Jesus was crucified for your sins, and they are forgiven, all of them, all of the ego, all of the best of intentions that never played out the way you wanted them to, all of the words you hide behind, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Jesus died for you, and those sins are forgiven. There is no better place than this, because this gives that. This gives those gifts that were accomplished there at that cross. This gives you the thing that is accomplished enough to call the whole thing 
Good Friday finished, even while we live in the after effects of the cross, we have its victory today. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the kingdom of God is built on that. And here, nothing can take away from it. Rejoice that you get to be a part of it. Here, God will feed you with forgiveness. Here, God will join you to life. Here, God will sustain you in the midst of sin and misery, death and decay. Here, here the vineyard grows because God's faithfulness is not a measuring stick. It is a gift given to the dying that would make them live. And that gift is yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.